So, social innovation is, there are, there are many definitions, right? Um, I'm going to break it down a little bit and then talk about how I define social innovation and where I think people should define it. So the first piece to define is the innovation part. So what is innovation? Innovation is, trying to define innovation is quite difficult, but in, in general I like to think about it as putting things in a, together in a new combination, a new way that produces value. There are lots of other definitions where people talk about commercializing inventions or commercializing ideas. I think that's a little bit specific because there are innovations within government sector that, and, and non-profit that may not be commercialized. And then the second word in that is social. This is the piece that, this is the word that is trickier to manage. <coughs> Before I talk about the social, what I want people to do is turn to the next pers person next to you and name a social movement. So just name two or three social movements that you can think of to the person next to you. So, give me some examples. What examples of social movements did you come up with? Any examples of social movements that you came up with? Feminism, Marxism, feminism, Marxism, rights. So rights. <laughs> Anybody else? Anybody else? Examples of social movements you came up with? They were saying like Black Lives Matter, Me Too. Black Lives Matter, Me Too. The one with the student protest last week. Student protest. They had the gun violence one. Yeah. Anybody else? Sorry? Similar. Similar? Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street, okay. Mm -hmm. Nobody in this room talked about things like alt right. Actually, we did, but I just scared to say it. <laughs> it's like, oh my so, God, it's so horrible. Yeah, so one of the things that happens is that when we think about social movements and social innovation, we tend to think about the movements that are aligned with our values. So we have this blind spot. So when we think about social, when I ask somebody to define social innovation earlier, they say social change. That usually implies something to do with benevolence, something to do with social innovation is about doing good. And I, I always like to start these things by reminding people that social movements can have bad outcomes as well. So the guys who are on NRA, they're creating a movement to support the Second Amendment. They're doing exactly what Another group of people is trying to do that's do gun control, etc. Okay, I always remind people that this is not about doing good social media. Um, the big insight that this came for me is when I was I was I studied midwives in my PhD thesis, and the reason I chose midwives as a social innovation is because you had birth in the home initially, birth in the hospital, and then you had a hybrid of that. Now, today, you have birthing centers, some people are having birth at home, and you have hospitals. When birth moved into the hospitals, the biggest thing that happened was the, the improvement in morbidity and mortality rates. So, there was a time before we had invented hospitals that a mother would prepare for death at the same time that she was preparing to give birth. So, these hospitals that were saving lives but it was this incredible innovation that changed a lot. But then what happened was that you began to have a lot of medical interventions, so caesareans and those kinds of things that came from with obstetrics, which was a negative side of a very positive innovation. So what, when we think about the word social, social somehow means, generally we're talking about social 
And I tried to get away from that, talking about and thinking about what is social relation. Um, questions, comments on that little piece there? It's got quite a, I, I've got some direct relationship to what you're talking about. And the continuum is quite interesting as well. That's yeah, I wrote a whole piece on your issue, and it's like, yeah, it's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Not, not to take away from the social movement as a topic, but you said negative consequences of cesarean or of, of intervention. So, what up, you have over, so in, especially in the US, a lot of these stats in the US, basically, if you step into a hospital, your chance of a medical intervention, some people say necessary or unnecessary, ups by about 40% in some hospitals, depending. So a cesarean is a pretty serious operation, but in some hospitals it's like as rates as high as 80%, 90%. Mm -hmm. So part of my study was I did peace in Trinidad and peace in Canada. And actually, forget that, in the US, there was one study that showed that cesarean rates increase with like around 10 and 9, which also happened to coincide with shift change. So what was happening is that doctors were like, oh shit, I gotta get home, let's just get this baby up. <laughs> <laughs> Which is not great for the, for, for the woman who wants choice of birth. And that's what midwifery is about. Women want to choose how to give birth, and most women are choosing natural. So there's that. And then in Trinidad, you had doctors who would charge more if they had to come out at night for delivery. Statistically, most births happen at night. So you end up having these weird things that happen, these absurdities that really happen that are supposed to be good. This is on the theory side. Um, I really like this guy. He talks about how before we can de define some uh, uh, concept, most people are defining things in terms of fact, value, and meaning. So when we talk about social innovation before we define it, people say this is or isn't a social innovation. They attach meaning, whether it's good or bad. Um, and same thing with value. And what he's, his thing is that until you are certain on what the concept is, you can't be sure about fact, value, and meaning. So start with the concept. So conceptually, what are we talking about when we talk about social innovation? So what, I, what I'm really trying to do is reframe the word social to mean relationships, focusing on relationships and interactions. So social, social today means social media. So I went to uh, another session on social learning, and what they meant was digital learning, and they meant like online learning, but they kept calling it social learning. So the, the word social is being changed and morphed into something that, to me, does not coincide with what I think about as what social should be. So when I talk about what I'm doing social innovation, I'm really trying to change the relationships within organizations and sectors. And I think that's going to become more and more important. So I just like this quote. The quote I just said, I just really like this quote around relationships. Um, this lady is actually a dog trainer. She trains dogs and she talks about the relationships with dogs. Um, so everything turns on the interactions. And it's the interactions that they determine high performing teams, they determine how you get innovation happening within your organization, trust psychological safety, all those things, which is why I think social innovation is going to play a major role within society and business moving forward. The definition that I use is that social innovations do three things. They change flow of resources, they challenge existing paradigms, and they change relationships or interactions. What's kind of cool is that now we do a scale, and you can rate them on one to five within each company. Where do we think we are? On a scale of one to five, are we changing resources? Are we changing paradigms? Are we changing relationships? And one of my cool examples of this is actually one of, one, of, one of my favorite examples of this is actually modern elevator. I like it because it's unintuitive. It's a very odd example. So the elevator is a really interesting example of social innovation because prior to the elevator, most buildings would have been four stories high. The most expensive room would be one at the bottom, right? And the people who would be on the top would be the artists and the writers. And that's traditionally what happened. And then as we improved building standards, etc., and we could now use elevators that can build 20, 30, 40 stories. It took about 20 years for real estate 
agents to convince people of this concept we now call the penthouse. And now the penthouse is the most expensive, most and most likely to die from fire or plane crash. <laughs> Let's forget about that. <laughs> but this innovation has transformed city skylines across the world, and it's I love it because of how hidden it is, and it's not something that people think about. But when you look at the history of the elevator, and even we take for we take for granted that the most expensive room or apartment would be the penthouse. When at one point that wasn't always the case. And if you track, there's, there's a guy who wrote a really interesting book about it. If he tracked the prices, and it took about 20 years for that to become the norm on real estate. And the, the biggest thing that people didn't like was they'll have to interact with strangers in the lobby or etc. because they're moving from a single household where they, nobody else except their families on that moving to high density population where they might run into strangers. People who do not look, sound like them, etc. So that was the biggest challenge. And I really like this as an example. The other reason I like about this example is that it's a passive innovation. So nobody said, hey, we're going to go out and really find the city skyline. That's not what happened. We invented the elevator and then we started doing higher buildings, etc. and that transformed. Right now, when people talk about social innovation, what they're talking about is more of an active intervention. When somebody is hiring me, they are actively trying to transform their company. But a lot of times, when we draw an example, some of the examples are passive examples. So I like to make sure, when you look at a case study, make sure you're looking at a case study that's an active case study and not a passive one. So the elevator is a bit of a passive one. Nobody did it really. It was not like midwifery, for example. Midwifery, a group of women decided, we want choice of birth and we're going to like, they had some really cool manipulative stuff that they did, we could talk about it after. But they were awesome in how they did it. So for example, if they wanted to get a meeting and they knew this midwife gave birth with this person's, this minister's wife gave birth with this midwife, they go talk to that midwife who would talk to the wife who then talk to the minister. It was awesome. That's, that's the kind of thing that they did, that was awesome. The other thing, the other piece around thinking about social innovation, innovation is that we have this sort of solvability assumption in our world, and that comes from a scientific thinking where we, like, particularly scientific management, because I'm talking about in context of business, where things are reducible to truth or not. And I want to argue that things are not that simple, and we don't have definite solutions. If you haven't read this book, um, I quite like it. It's, it's called The Wisdom of Crowds. And James, I do not know how to say that last name, but he, what I liked about it is that he talked about there are three kinds of problems, problems of cognition, problems of coordination, and problems of cooperation. Cognition problems, he argues, are they have a definite solution. So it's sort of a binary solution. You know, we can think our way to that solution. Then he talked about coordination, coordination type problems, which is, requires people to coordinate. So all of us need to come together today to make PodCamp happen, and we decide to coordinate, etc. His third problem that he talks about is cooperation problem, which is getting self-interested, distrust of people to work together even when narrow self-interest would seem to dictate that no individual should take part. And he talks about things like pollution, taxes, agreeing on fair pay, etc. So these sort of what we might call wicked problems, these big problems, pollution, climate change might be one of those examples. I, I liked how he broke that down and talked about it. Um, but there's another woman who, what, what I realized in reading that is that often we are using solutions that may not be appropriate, appropriately type of problem it is. So some of our solutions might be binary when really it's a coordination problem, it's not a, it's not, a cognition problem, so understanding that. So I began to look for some other models that would be more intuitive and better for understanding that. And Brenda Zimmerman came up with this. She's a prophet. She's a late prophet at Schulich, who I also happened to work with. I was fortunate enough to work with, but she passed away two years ago. She came up with this concept called simple, complicated, complex problems. So a simple problem, she argued, is like baking a cake except for the one in the bottom right. Those cakes are pretty simple. 
But generally, if you follow a recipe of a cake, you can get it, especially if you do like a Betty Crocker type cake. That's a simple problem. So those simple problems need to have simple solutions. Complicated problems, she argued, are more like launching a rocket or coordinating a, a concert where you have five stages or 10 stages with like 100,000 people. That is a complicated problem. With enough resources and expertise, we can address that problem. So same, and so they're using launching the rocket as an example. Complex problem, she argues, is like raising a child. When you change your parenting style, the child changes their response. The child changes their response, you change your parenting style. And I, and the other example who I got, actually I think he's at Ryerson. Um, uh, I forget his name right now, but he talks about how complex problems are like a garden, raising a garden. You plant, you plant certain seeds, but you have no idea what's going to pop up. And that complex problem. So what I liked about these things is that most of us tend to look at problems like this, where we there's a definitive path. And what I think is happening is we we're misattributing the type of problem with the kind of solution we need. So we it, with simple problems we can have simple solutions, but often complex problems we're applying complex solutions. My favorite example of this is using protection among teenagers, right? The simple solution, use a condom. What we don't teach teenagers is, you're like 17 years old, you're horny, you're in front of that girl, and you gotta be like, stop. I gotta put on this condom. That is a comp, that's suddenly become a complex scenario. That has become a relationship scenario. There's pride, there's like masculinity, <laughs> there's all kinds of stuff there. But the way we frame that problem, we frame it as a simple solution the simple, the simple solution is use protection. The implementation of it is complex. If you, when you go back into your workplace, you are guaranteed you're going to see this everywhere all of a sudden. It's going to pop up, you're going to be seeing, holy shit, we're applying a simple solution to what's really a complex problem. I can uh, The simple complex, uh, Brenda Zimmerman? Brenda Zimmerman, yeah. Did she coin the term simplexity? No. No? I just felt like I'd heard that. That's a whole different. Sorry. I don't want to get into complexity theory right now. That's a simple different thing. Um, the other thing I didn't, actually, that's a good point. Chaos is a piece where she would talk about simple, complicated, complex, and chaos. And chaos would be like emergency scenarios where you have an earthquake or like hurricane or something like that. That's, you, are, you need a very different kind of approach and solution approach in that kind of environment. So people would be able to see. Any other questions before? So, the other place where I think this comes in is that, as with the rise of automation, I think the simple, complicated, complex paradigm begins to play out in really interesting ways. So, I shouldn't have put chaos in there, because that would be wrong, I think, actually, but, actually, probably right, actually. but, artificial intelligence is most likely to so solve for simple problems, then complicated, then complex, then chaos. Which, is, which means that most jobs are going to follow, loss of jobs is also going to follow a similar trend. So you're most likely to see changes or loss of jobs with any simple complicated realm. So jobs that are quite menial and repetitive, etc., are going to be replaced through automation, through AI, etc. So I think within the workplace, we're going to be dealing with more complex and chaotic problems, which is where the more variables you have, in a scenario, the less likely you can get AI and robots to do, do those kind of things. The one caveat is that within those contexts, there are some things that AI and automation will help with, but the overall chaotic scenario, it's unlikely that your jobs are going to be displaced there. So people who are doing jobs that are more complex are less likely to be taken over by automation, which is why I think social media is going to play a major role. Can you give examples of both of those scenarios? What types of jobs are we talking about in the So accounting, for example, would be a good example of like, that's a complicated thing that can be taken over by um, automation AI kind of interfaces. The one, one example I think is going to be a long time before it, a, a robot is able to handle this is couples counseling, mm. conflict management. <laughs> <laughs> it's unlikely that robots are going to be taking over those kinds of jobs anytime soon. Um, so I think thinking about where your career trajectory is, keeping this in mind might be a little bit. 
<laughs> Actually, there is a, a project from IBM. They are working on um, employment counseling, like for career development. So they are working on that already. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's a matter of asking the questions and using the mind the data from the career paths of other employees. So they are using. But I would argue that they're going to deal with these simple pieces first, and they're going to get more and more complex. Yeah, the empathy is not yeah. there, right? The, exactly. So I think they, they are working. I'm, say, I'm not saying it's not going to happen. I'm saying it's, that's going to be last to make. That's the final frontier kind of thing, is what I'm saying. Um, so how do we create the conditions for, I'm now changing the term social disruption from social innovation. How do we create the conditions for that? So what I mean by social disruptions is a disruption that changes the social dynamics within the context. And just to make that visual, is a lot of times what we have is we have some kind of challenge or problem, you have some kind of framework you're working in, and you have a desired outcome of social change that you want. And social change can happen in, in companies or it can happen in in um, like nonprofit sector. We tend to think of social change only in nonprofit sector, but if you're going to transform the culture of an organization, that's a social change. Um, so what, I, what I'm arguing is that what you need to do is pay attention is that social innovation is going to give us that desired outcome to social change. But we have to figure out what are they, how are we going to change resources, how we, what paradigms do we need to change or challenge, and what social relationships are going to change as, in order for us to have that desired outcome of social change. This is one of my favorite quotes. Um, by accepting the prescribed ritual, a person becomes a player in the game, thus making it possible for the game to go on, for it to exist, for it to exist in the first place. Which basically is saying that we have to deliberately, this is an active thing, we have to deliberately decide we're going to disrupt. One of my favorite examples is um, Bruce Puntip. He runs G Adventures. And at one point, he just blew up his HR department because everything he was trying to do, they were like, you can't do that, you can't do that, you can't do that. He's like, we have no more HR department. Like, <laughs> completely transformed this company by not by bringing his HR into his leadership team. That's a massive sort of change. So what so what I what I add is that for us to be able to make those transitions happen, we have to figure out what is the social innovation, what's it sort what's the disruption that's gonna happen, that's gonna give us our desired outcome. So really paying attention to that zone is where I think a lot of innovation is actually going to come from. Some examples of Social disruption. So in my day job, this is what I do all the time, is that a lot of times we work with a lot of sales companies. So whether it's insurance, real estate, um, pharmaceuticals, whatever. Most sales people will make the bulk of their money in December. And that's because that's when your quota is. So you ramp up your sales and you tend to make it in December. What we teach people to do is we go through strategy, structure, systems and processes, financial management, change the things that they're doing, the activity they're doing every single day, so that you level out the sales. So if you can make a certain sales quota in December, why not level that out and make the same thing January through to April, April through to August, August through to December. That's what we coach people to do all the time. So that's an example of how I'm using social media in my everyday life. My other favorite example is Dorothy Day. Dorothy Day, as you heard Dorothy Day, sort of phenomenal kind of philosoph philosopher kind of person. But she was, she lived through the 1906 San Francisco earthquake and really wanted to know, she saw people come together, people who would normally hate each other, black, white, Jewish, whatever, they all helped each other. And what she asked is, how can we, how can we not keep this all the time? How can we not be in this state? all the time, how can we not be in this altruistic state? What happened was that the earthquake disrupted our social norms, shed all of the nonsense that we have that keeps us back, keeps that racism, keeps that and friend, foe kind of thing happening, and people began to help each other. And I like that extreme example of how that really disrupted the social norms for a little bit. And as soon as safety came back, people went right back to their prejudiced behaviors that they had before. And her question was, how do we keep that altruism all the time? This is a bit of a sad story, Ignace Simmelweis. Um, 
he was a doctor with in the early in the late 1800s early 1900s that's kind of when science was kind of coming into its like strength people were beginning to do scientific method and he looked at some data and realized that in one ward about 6 to 800 women were dying from childbed fever and in the other ward only 60 mothers and babies were dying in that ward and he was trying to figure out why he would look outside he was looking for all these other data he realized it wasn't happening outside of the hospital so he knew it wasn't a virus it wasn't a plague it wasn't and they, in those days they still believed it was plagues so he knew it wasn't a plague and his mentor cut his hand while doing an autopsy and died from similar symptoms that the babies in the ward were dying from and he realized now what was happening is that doctors were going straight from doing an autopsy right into delivery without washing their hands. They had, he had also noticed, this was an accidental thing, he had noticed that chlorine removes the smell from things. So he got people to wash their hands with chlorine before they went from the autopsy to deliver babies. And the death rate in, improved dramatically. It was something like 67% improvement. Problem was, he was a young doctor, he was a bit of an outsider, and people didn't really like him, and he was very aggressive with how he did it. So all the other doctors took it personally and thought he was blaming them for the deaths. They kicked him out of the hospital, he died a very sad death. I think he actually died from the same symptoms of childhood fever. But it took 20 years, and another researcher in another hospital, to pretty much figure out germ theory. And it wasn't until another 20 years that they were able to change that behavior. And that was a social disruption. That was, he was unable to make that social innovation happen within that hospital. You had 600 deaths a year for 20 years. And for a very low cost thing of washing their hands. Um, I'm not going to get into this, but washing hands is a massive problem still today. Um, in the food industry, it's about... I think it's like 37.8% of people wash their hands properly in the food industry and in the medical industry it's like 38 or 38.1 people percent of people. So there are actually some really good examples of interventions where people have been able to improve washing hands. So I, actually washing hands is always an example I use. Another quirky example I like to use of social innovation, social change thing is these monkeys. This little monkey, she figured out that if she if she got potat potatoes and she washed it in water, before all the older monkeys would sort of dust off the potatoes, take off the dust, and they would eat it. She figured out if she went to the river and she washed it off, it was a much better sweet potato. It didn't have the dust and the dirt. Her brothers and sisters started following and it spread throughout the whole island and then all the monkeys started doing it. The same monkey went to the seaside and noticed if I washed, wash it in the salt water, I'm seasoning the sweet potato. And it tasted way better. So our brothers and sisters started following, and it spread throughout the entire island. Same kind of thing happened. And again, I like that example because it's a bit of an odd one. It shows it in animals. It's a really cool little example um, of how that behavior spread through that um, colony of monkeys. The last example comes from one of my podcasts, um, podcast episodes. I hope it works. Example of disruption or systems change that you can think of or that you'd want to share with the listeners. Two very inspiring examples to me. I am Erie Van Steenhoven example through the Casco Brigade of the sandwich shop owner, where this sandwich shop owner wants to set up shop in the city and the effort to do so requires going through multiple departments at different levels of government and how the Casco Brigade worked with those departments with, the, with that sandwich shop owner, brought them all into the sandwich shop and, and showed them what the impact of that the system was having on the citizen. And I thought that example was great to me because in it, you, you start with the citizen in mind and you understand the, their experience. And it's difficult in government or any, in, in, it's difficult anywhere to be able to see the whole system. You know, if you're working day to day from your 
from your perspective, you just see your perspective, but it's difficult to understand the whole. And and you can it's easier to do so when you start from the user's point of view. I like the example too because it didn't it wasn't an example of deregulation. It was an example where the value of the regulations that were um, that were being enforced was recognized. But the question and where the innovation came from was how do we maintain the standard of that these regulations provide while also making it easier for the citizen to make their idea a reality for them to produce value for their community and for, for their family and themselves. So from that, I, re I think the recognition is that innovation comes from that attention and the, the value and importance of putting the user at the center. And I started, we started to call about, you know, nothing about us without us. I mean, that is where we start to see through you know, this public sector design approaches where we can, we do have mechanisms and practices and tools to effectively and efficiently incorporate or integrate that principle. And we have a similar example here in, in New Brunswick under integrated service delivery where we brought multiple departments together around segment of the student population to provide, to design the services around them as opposed to around the service provider or the policy maker. And so those are like, those are some of the, the best examples from my point of view and sort of the, in, in, in examples of where it is that I'd like to work. And to sort of highlight those examples, so we might not call them innovation, right? We might not call it integrated service delivery innovation or, or what have you, but it's important to, to start to identify those cases, recognize them and share those stories across the public service to demonstrate what it is we mean by innovation and, and, and to to model the behavior we want to see more of. So what I like about that example is that his name is Nick Scott and he works in the government sector in project and he's trying to bring innovation into there, which is for most of us is quite oxymoron ish. It's like it's, most people don't think about government and innovation. What I like about that example is that they brought the people who were designing solutions with the sandwich shop owner and said to them, look at how terrible this experience is for the sandwich shop owner. All he wants to do is sell sandwiches. How can we make that system different and easier for him, to na him or her to navigate that, that system? And, and that's where I think social innovation is really going to play a big role in society moving forward, especially with the role of automation. What I also like about it is that it's, it's in, in things like design thinking, systems thinking, um, integrated thinking, things that have traditionally been left for branding agencies and design agencies are now becoming part of, for example, the public sector. So I think it's going to be a major change that we're going to see in the next couple of years. So my message today is just that I do think that social innovation, social disruption is going to play a major role in society and business moving forward. And I, those are some of my examples that I used. I like added 10 more slides because I thought last presentation I did, I finished in half an hour. And this one, I still finish in half an hour. I don't know. <laughs> and this is a favorite, another good quote of mine, Franklin Roosevelt. If civilization is to survive, we must cultivate the science of human relationships. If you have any questions, comments, feel free. We have half an hour left. It's fine. <laughs> Me adding 10 more slides. Uh, just, just in the hand washing thing, because I did look into that uh, when I was in the undergrad. I think one of the coolest uh, innovations that I heard, because everyone wanted big technical solutions and patient tracking and RFID and all that, they found that putting mirrors over top of hand washing, like the dispensers, would make people pause long enough to take a look at themselves in the mirror and just naturally do it and then keep going on about their day. And it was just such a low tech, like so social. There's, a, there's another example of that, which um, it's one of my slides I took out. Um, <laughs> what, in, in the, an example is that they did all these like high tech things and they realized that basically if you shout at people and say, hey, if you don't wash your hands, this is what's gonna happen. If you don't wash your hands, what they did is they put a, a screen in front and every time people wash their hands, the score went up. Mm -hmm. So they had different departments, had different mm -hmm. scores. So if you wash your hands, you saw the score go up. And it jumped from 38% to like 90% compliance with washing their hands. What was really cool about it is they did it for three months. When it took out the technology, it dropped to 80%. So it maintained the behavior being maintained. 
So that was kind of cool with that. So similar thing, the mirror, and the, there's actually two studies that talk about it. It's really, it's really cool. Yeah. I saw a hand, yeah. You kind of alluded to design thinking, and having the, like the podcast itself, he was talking about the citizen. There is a difference between uh, redesigning something that is already in place or creating something new, innovating, like the iPhone, for instance. Right? In your experience, like what you've seen as the most productive, the most uh, impactful in terms of uh, organizations that are trying to change is recreating or potentially coming up with a new process or something. Yeah. First one is always cheaper. It's always cheaper than like not have to create. But how effective is it? How? So it depends. So in the two examples we just used in hand washing or like the example, the sandwich shop owner, very, very effective. They just like changed. I would call that a process innovation. So would, or like a process innovation, like they're changing a process. It could be like price, there could be product innovation. So the iPhone might be a product innovation kind of thing. Um, one thing I do want to make a distinction with is the iPhone in particular is more, I would put that more in terms of an invention. Okay. Because there is a possible world where Apple could have built the iPhone and it wouldn't have been adopted. So if it wasn't adopted, it would be still considered an innovation. If it wasn't adopted, I'd argue it wouldn't be considered an innovation, despite it being an invention. Mm -hmm. And it really depends on, so for example, one of the companies we're working with, we invent, we uh, we developed a brand new insurance product, but that's a whole new, we, we're inventing this new product. If it's not taken up in the market, we just wait two and a half years. You know what I mean? So it, it, and it, it's a very expensive process, or you could tweak an existing one. So it just depends, it really depends on sector, industry, the kind of problem, etc. So there's no answer to that, and that's why I like the simple, complicated, complex <coughs> model, because what we're trying to do is uh, let's forefront that a lot of these problems are actually complex problems, and the solutions we're trying to put on them are actually simple solutions. So what I'm trying to do in my work is reframe people to appropriately put a complex solution to a complex problem. And knowing when you're doing that is, I think, will redefine your performance. That's, that's kind of what I argue. So, questions? Another one, uh, just to pose the case and as a possibility. So I noticed, I think we all did that, you have the comedy group as, as uh, your slide label, and I'm assuming that means you do this as a service for people sometimes? Yeah, this is my, this is the company that I joined, and I was lucky enough to like, get to impl implement my PhD thesis, that's awesome, that never happens. It's, it's, it's a super <laughs> cool, niche. Uh, I, I just, I know, not to move away from technology solutions, but at least frame them in a way that they're not, the be all end all. I kept thinking about, um, you know, like RFID trackers for when you lose your stuff? Yeah. Uh, and it's technically addressing a social issue of when people find something, do they make the effort to return it? Is there altruism? Like, there's a lot of bigger issues behind it. But uh, from a tech point of view, they were arguing that because anyone that has these these devices, their phone will ping it, they can help find uh, each other's devices and let you know without actually letting the person basically scavenge around for it. And I kept just thinking, like, the whole issue they have is you have to have more users to make that value in, exactly, yeah. in their product. Everybody has to have it, yeah. And I, I don't like I, I know it's common to all social platforms, like is the value is in is in the people, is in the group. But I don't even know how you begin to buy some of so, that. So uh, that's that's one of the examples where I think so for example, I think I generally tell clients the technical side or the technology side, forget that part. We can solve that part. Okay. We can figure out the technology, we can figure out what code we need to write, we can figure out what invention we need. that's the easy part. The hard part is the people behavior part. That's the part that like <laughs> I can't predict, etc. So that's a great example of we have the technology, we know we, we know what the answer, the problem is the people behavior there, what's the connection there. So for example, I think if that's gonna work, it's gonna piggyback off of technology that people already have. So when everybody was carrying the phone, you added a camera to it, that everybody had the infrastructure, the infrastructure was there, people already changed their behavior when they were carrying the phone. Right. Now that everybody's carrying a phone that also sends email connected to the internet. Most of these phones are not even phones anymore. It's basically made supercomputers in a pocket. Yeah. yeah. Now I can piggyback onto that and do all kinds of other cool shit like, and also very scary stuff like I work in the insurance space. Like what insurance companies are thinking about doing with your data is very scary. <laughs> Just say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
So, but you can't have that unless there's some, some. So, for example, FedEx is a good example. Mm -hmm. FedEx would not have been successful if it didn't put its own infrastructure in place. So, um, for them to be able to keep the promise of overnight deliveries, they had to get their own planes. They had to put that infrastructure in place. And there are lots of examples where companies, to be successful, they realize we know what we want to do, but this, if we rely on the current infrastructure, we're not going to deliver deliver our promise. Any other questions, comments? I feel like I should do my other slides, but I don't. Yeah. I don't. I don't have time to talk about. Sorry. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Could you talk a little more about what, what so what you've done since your PhD? Like, what do you do professionally? Like, how you put this all to work? So there's a there's a big part of my job that's under like non disclosure agreement. So I can't okay. <laughs> <laughs> Elevator pitch then. <laughs> and then there's a so the piece the piece that I can't talk about is that the main line of our business is helping um, entrepreneurs really find their performance. So that stuff is pretty simple. Though. An entrepreneur is making between two hundred and six hundred thousand dollars a year. They want to up that to like. 1.5 to 2 million a year. They come to us, we work with them, we go through strategy, structure, system, processes, financial management, and we really find their small enterprise and they get more sales, etc. So we have a whole process that we run them through called the Business Builder Program. That's pretty straightforward. On the innovation side, we use a lot of, actually, I could actually show you some of that probably. Um, Actually, this is this is this is the model we use. Um, I I hit those slides, so let me unhide the slides. So okay, all right. Can you see that? Right. So we have that stage where we, that's usually our research stage, which is understand and it would piggyback off things like design thinking, so it's integrated that. And we use some we use massive data kind of approaches. So we have a tech partner who does all kinds of different approaches to understanding a demographic, a psychographic kind of thing. So we do that. That's we spend a lot of time doing that in this understanding phase. Um, then we'll design the solution. So um, based on the data we get. We try and design something that we think might uh, might work. Mm -hmm. Then we go into what we call the prototyping phase, which, as much as possible, we try to prototype that on paper or like at, with li minimum cost as possible, or we build like some kind of model or test to test our assumptions. Um, then we go through and we do an evaluation piece, which is usually one of the shorter cycles. We evaluate what the prototype did, and really this is a, it's evaluating the prototype and our assumptions in that prototype. Um, that's the model we use. There are different methodologies within each quadrant that we draw on, depending on the problem that comes to us. And what we do that's different from other people is we cycle back. So we go back to understanding, which is why it's a figure eight. The thing that's really misleading about that diagram is that we, e we are evaluating all the way through, but just in that last quadrant, we focus on evaluation. If that makes sense. So it's really getting me to stop this linear thinking, and that's thinking cycles. Um, and that's very much informed by that complexity framework that I talked about. So a client will come in with a problem, <coughs> first thing we start doing is by doing research. Um, one of my friends was here yesterday, Cheyenne, he did a presentation around um, I think you call it authenticity in branding or something. That com when he worked with that company, they did a similar process, but it came from a branding lens. Mm -hmm. But they would first do the research and understanding mission, vision, what are you really trying to accomplish? And then they would design a whole brand strategy around that. So when we do this process, we usually end up giving a report. Our report generally goes to a design team who design use those insights to design um, a look and feel based on what we want to do, what the company's personality we want, based on the assumptions that we have. And we pull in different partners that we want to. So 
our the data guys we have, they're really good. Like I developing personas by house, by zip code, we can do that kind of thing. So that's really cool stuff that we that I like to do. So yeah. Uh, yeah, sub question though, uh, based on that. So from the looks of that, it, I'd say as an outsider, it looks like you would have to invest a long-term amount of time to work with a client. How many of your clients expect things to turn around? Like, this is a long process. It yeah, looks we like- We won't work with you if you expect you to do it. So right. Like, we just not Because- Like, someone have, on the phone quick is like usually what everyone wants. Yeah, right? so that's fine. Like, yeah. we won't work with you. Like, I'm mean, very clear on that. So, if you're into transformation, if you want to change and redefine your company, you come to us. Right. If you, if you are in a hurry to, like, I don't know what you want to do. Like, make some kind of quarterly objective. We're not, we usually, our clients are like two, three years engagement. Like, this is not, and to be honest, most times when you do that quick thing, they're going to come to us in like eight months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I'm, just, I'm not being angry tonight, just like, that's what happens. Like, right. people, I'll give you a, another example. Somebody came to us recently and said, we want an engagement. We want you all to do a one day team building thing like just a team building session and we're like, that's not how we build teams. Like you can't do a one day retreat and then have a high performing team. And we're like, but this is our budget, this is what we want, you should be doing it. I'm like, but we're not doing that, we can find somebody else to do it. And, cause we just, that's not how teams, we build teams. And so we're very, that's how we call ourselves a covering group, which is we keep our promise. So we're not gonna engage with you unless we mutually agree that this is gonna create the outcome you want. That's, and that's a very difficult conversation because you're telling clients no. So yeah. Right. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Just to what you just said, uh, there's a company work for that I actually really appreciate what they did. They would schedule coffee dates from people in different departments that you were nice. rotation. Yeah. It was super helpful because it, it breaks down those, not just barriers of like knowledge, but the willingness to strike up a conversation with someone that might be different than you. Mm -hmm. See, that's what I call the social innovation side. Like yeah. people are not paying attention like we are paying attention to the glitz and the, the, mm -hmm. the glitter. Yeah. And yeah. It's, that, it's the social side that's going to really find the company, like coffee. Yeah. That's yeah. a look. Super simple, but. Which is why yeah. I use the washing the hands example. The washing the hands example, 20 years, 20 years, you weren't washing hands. Like, seriously? People die. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? So I, that's, that's, that's why I, I do think, I would always argue that a lot of the high performance is going to come, not from the tech. It's going to come from the social side. Like you can have the best technology and a team that's in fighting, and your company will be a low performing team. Uber is an example of that. I don't, I don't think Uber is going to be here in the long run. That's my guess. I think like a company that builds slowly and like, and that's another problem with the VC cap, cap VC world. Because you're so driven by metrics, what your funders, a lot of entrepreneurs will tell you this, like founders will tell you this. You can bring in VC or VC funding and it will wreck the culture of your company. And there are so many examples of people who had great products, brought in VCs who put in like really aggressive targets and the company's not around anymore. That is, there are tons of examples of that. So, do, do you have any, I mean, I'm not saying that, but any links to things to look that up? To you as yeah, you like, if just Google, if you just Google, just Google like, failed, like companies that were worth like millions and <laughs> like worth nothing, like there are lots of those. Like, yeah. There's one in, I think Pebble maybe, mm -hmm. in, in um, Waterloo. There, there are lots of examples. I can't, not even coming to mind right now, but there are lots of examples. Where, actually, Jawbone. Jawbone, they did speakers and stuff. That company was about to like blow up bows and all that stuff. That company doesn't exist anymore. What happened to that? I can't remember the details, but some kind of infighting that happened and okay. companies, they don't exist. I am very glad I didn't buy the products though. <laughs> <laughs> Just a comment on the uh, example used as San Francisco earthquake. Yeah. We had mm -hmm. in 2003 the blackout here. Yep. And that was to see people on the streets like we have no power and how people are reacting to that. And the, the innovation that they were coming up with Stuff like, oh, I, I'm not going to have food because the food is going bad, yeah. so I'm going to give away. Yeah, it was interesting to see the. That would never happen on a Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so there's another example. I, I like Brenny Brown a lot. And Brenny mm -hmm. Brown talked about how she was on a podcast. I think she was on 
on being podcast, talked about the same thing. She talked about Dream, they had a, she had a flood recently. Nobody was saying, hey, you're black, I'm not going to help you. Nobody was saying, hey, you're Jewish. Nobody did that. People just help people. Like, how do we create those situations? Keeps yeah, yeah, but I think, you know, if you, I think well, it's kind of interesting, I'm listening to everybody talk about like natural disasters, mm -hmm. but if we actually just look at what happens, Christmas is a perfect example of that. Like mm -hmm. everybody's happy and nice mm -hmm. and friendly and helpful and, you know, there are people who are like pissed off because of the commercialism, yeah. but it changes people's attitudes, like people are overtly kinder during the Christmas season, mm -hmm. and then they go back to yeah. being themselves after that, and it happens every year. We don't even really so, think about it in that context. So why? The why blackout was not a natural disaster, by the way. Huh? The blackout was not a natural disaster. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Was no, no, it's not. Right there, but yeah, yeah no. Yeah, the point is, one, yeah. one of the things that I find that I feel unicky about my job mm. is that in many ways I'm nudging people into behavior, or like mm -hmm. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm creating a situation where. I want people to behave in a certain way. So the, in, in the literature, it's called co coercive persuasion. Mm -hmm. um, within a learning context, you want to avoid any kind of coercive behavior in it or attitudes in any way. Coercing people into doing things is not a generally good idea. Mm -hmm. But it's pretty much impossible. It's one of the contradictions of the work we do, is that if you set this goal, you have to persuade everybody in the team to go after this goal. And there's a bit of manipulation, there's a bit of like incentivizing that happens. So one of the things that we tend, like to think about, like I do another talk where I talk about, you don't have a, your team is not a family, you're a team. So if somebody needs to go, they need to go. Like that's, that's just how business works. People don't like hearing that, it's a very uncomfortable conversation, but it's the same thing. Like. If this is the target, there's a little bit of course of persuasion that happens and you have to find people who believe in this mission and they go with it. But there's, there's a, Edgar Schein talks about that. Yeah, because I mean, if you're going to change a culture, there has to be consequences because some people will get on board with it and then there will be others who will resist. And so there has to be some sort of negative con consequence that impacts them that will drive their behavior because you can change people's behavior but it's very difficult to change their attitude. Their attitude is not going to change. So I would I would always go with a carrot versus a stick in that context. If you use a carrot approach, you're probably going to get better results than if you use a stick. And that's kind of what I'm saying. Like I'm just saying there's a bit of manipulation with that. Me going into the company and saying, hey, people use stick approaches that don't realize. And I'm telling you, hey, if you do that, you're unlikely to shift me. So there's a bit of ickiness that I do that. Matt, you have a question? I'll follow up when we're, when we're done. I just wanted to get a quote from you correctly. No <laughs> <laughs> worries. Yeah. Uh, last question, because I think he's right. Yeah, tired. Yeah. 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 All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.